I want to talk to you today about the fact that God wants to be with us. He's not a distant God. Uh, he's a God who wants to be with us. And you see that right from the beginning of the Bible, all the way through to the end of the Bible, that God wants to be with us. He doesn't want to be like some vague concept that's out there somewhere. He wants to be with us. And it is so clear in the Bible, it's just absolutely incredible. Last week we talked about how it's possible, given that there's a holy God and we're sinners, and we talked about um, Jesus' sacrifice his, uh, in, in our place. We talked about that, and that dealt with the issue of sin, so that God could be with us. But God has always wanted to be with us, ever since he created us and said, wow, that's very good. <laughs> yes? And he made man and woman in his image. We're going to look at, look at this. But um, right at the very start, in the in beginning of Genesis, uh, you'll see that God walked in the cool of the day with Adam and Eve. You can see in Ezekiel that one of the, uh, the, a name of God which describes his character. So God's name describes his character. So one of his names is the Lord, our righteousness. Well, God is a God who is righteous and wants to be our righteousness. Another name for God is God is our peace. And God's whole nature is peace, with that full richness of peace. Well, another name of God is the Lord is here and ready to act. Uh, the, the compound name is it's Jehovah Shammah, but that's what it's re written in Ezekiel 48. And it's talking about the, the new, the new, a new city, or new heavens and new earth, really. And the name of that, the city from that time on will be, the Lord is there. God, that's his character, his nature, is not to be a distant, away from us God. His nature is to be here with us, God. Um, and then that makes sense, doesn't it? Why? But Because loads of people don't know God. They don't know that God wants to be involved in their lives. They don't know that God made them. And that's our whole purpose, is to share the gospel. So that people can to know, know that God is a God who's interested and wants to be with them. Amazing, isn't it? Um, you look at the names of Jesus. So I'm moving right through the Bible here, okay. In the names of Jesus, um, in Matthew 1, 21, and the angel um, gives this message, she will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus. Why the name Jesus? Because he will save his people from their sins. And well, I talked about that particularly last week. So talking about the birth of Jesus, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel. Why? Which means God with us. It's right the way through it, God wants to be with us. In the Great Commission, when Jesus says to his disciples, Matthew 28, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So we've got that bit there. And teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. This is discipleship. I just want to say, if, if you're a new Christian, or if you, it's really important that you learn what Jesus taught. It's important to take the opportunities to, to find out what Jesus taught. So when... It's really, really important. That's part of being a disciple. You'll never go on with Jesus and be, be his disciple unless you learn, to, learn what he taught. Just bit by bit, bit by bit. That's what it is. Um, every, all of us are learning, but it's important that you dedicate and make sure you take the opportunities to do that. And surely, and then Jesus says, go and do this. And then what does he say? And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And you've got in Hebrews 13, 
Um, verse 5, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Because God has said, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. And then you move on from then Jesus. And then he talks about the Holy Spirit. And we're going to be looking um, at this over the next couple of weeks. Um, but Jesus says, I'm going to be with you. But then he says, I'm going away. <laughs> uh, the thing is, physically, Jesus could only be in a certain one location, a place and time. But he says, when I go away, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, which is also called the, um, the Spirit of Jesus. And the presence of God then comes as Jesus pours out the Holy Spirit. And in John 14, it says, if you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. So Jesus is going to go, and he says, when I've gone, I'm going to pour out the Holy Spirit. Is it possible to take this down a little bit? It's, it's, it's echoing. Um, uh, if, it's, um, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, and that's how he's going to be with us. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate. And that another means one just like me. That's what it means. So he's going to send the Holy Spirit who is just like Jesus. The spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him or knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you. And then he tells them, you're going to need to wait until you receive the gift of the promised Holy Spirit. And he says, for he lives with you and will be in you. And the, the, the presence of God and God being with us is in a whole brand new way. Where like um, H was talking about Jesus abiding in us. He does that by the Holy Spirit. Abiding, living within us. You can't get closer, like God wants to be near and with us. You can't get a lot closer than being with us and in us. <laughs> you just really can't. It's like when you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit, outside and inside, and just the presence of God is so real that God in us, Christ in you, the hope of glory, God is filling our lives. We're born again. And it is just incredible how close God wants to be with you. And this is the very nature of, of eternal life. When the Bible talks about eternal life, it's, it's God in us, all around us, and just such an awareness. And to know that God with us is absolutely incredible. We are not ordinary people. You are not an ordinary person. God is doing something, and that isn't going to stop. And it is so, so real. I'm not going to quote H again on that. But... The spirit of truth, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him or knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. And this is this understanding of Jesus by the Holy Spirit coming into our lives. And we'll see a little bit more about that from in Peter's speech on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came. And, uh, you know, you read about that in Acts chapter 2. You read about it in Acts chapter 1 and Acts, Acts chapter 2, um, that, that account. I just want to move on to the end of the Bible about God really wanting to be with us. Right from Genesis all the way through the Old Testament into the New Testament and Jesus and the, the early church and right to the Revelation. God wants to be with us. Even on into the end of time or whatever, you know, for ages to come, he wants to be with us. And, um, and it's only going to get better. When we look. But in Revelation um, 21, I was talking about the new heaven and the new earth. I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. There's no need for... Like it was a process to enter into the presence of God. 
God is there. The nations will walk by its light and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will it gates, its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and the honor of the nations will be brought into it. Now listen to this, this is important. This, nothing impure will ever enter into ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful. God is looking for people to worship him in spirit and in truth but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. That the, those names that are written in the Lamb's book of life, when you give your life to Jesus and say, Jesus, would you be my Lord and Savior? You are my Lord. I, I, give, you, I give you my life because of what you did for me. That minute, your name was written in the Lamb's book of life. God knew about it before all eternity, but when you gave your life to Jesus, your name was written in the Lamb's book of life. And you don't have to worry, am I good enough to get into heaven? Because you're not relying on your own goodness. You're re relying on what Jesus has done. And what Jesus has done is sufficient to take you to heaven. So, are you okay with it? God wants to be with you? Some of us might not always feel like that. In fact, I'm sure that some of us at times feel like, does God really want to be with me? Does he know what I'm like? And, you know, I'm a bit boring really. Has he got more interesting people? God wants to be with you. And he wants to be with us. That's his... It is totally consistent throughout all history that God is not a distant God who is so far removed from the earth. And a lot of people think he is. They think God is unreachable. And in one sense, he is unreachable. But he reached down to us. And that, that's what the message of the Bible is. And that's what the message of the gospel is. So, so people who don't know the gospel think, well, God's just this thing I can't get even close to. And that's where the gospel is. God brought us near through the blood of Jesus. That's the, the truth of the gospel. Okay, so that's the um, introduction. I'm not going to go on for ages and ages. I, I want to go back into the story of God being with Adam and Eve, or creating Adam and Eve and being with them. I think it's important uh, that we do that. And then and see that God wanted to walk in the cool of the day with Adam and Eve. In fact, he did walk with the, in the cool of the day with Adam and Eve and enjoyed fellowshipping with them. And that's what he wants to do with you and me. That was then, now, right now, we walk in step with the Holy Spirit. That's God with us. That, that's a, the, the comparison I just want to bring with you. That was then... God walking in whatever form that he walked, but probably, I don't, I don't know what form he walked in with Adam and Eve, but they had fellowship together. Now we walk in step together with the Holy Spirit. We have fellowship with the Holy Spirit. That's our current way that we live our lives with God. Okay, that's, that's the simplicity of what I'm, I'm saying to you today. Let's look in Genesis chapter 1. In Genesis chapter 1, it's describing the creation of the, the world. And this is, Genesis chapter 1 is challenged massively in our society. Absolutely massively in our society about God being the creator and everything. But you can read it. I'm just going to talk about making mankind. So in Genesis 1, 26, then God said, let us make mankind in our image. In our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. We're different from animals. 
we're able to create, we're able to be... Uh, animals, you know, they're great. Obviously, loads of people love animals, but there's a total different thing. There's not a moral sort of um, decision-making process going on within animals. There's, um, there's not the ability to worship God in the way that, that we have. We're so different. But listen to, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. And guess what? Male and female, he created them. One of the biggest things, I just don't, don't ever be ashamed of quoting, quoting Genesis 1, that God made us in his image, male and female, he made us. It's binary, it's not non-binary, the way that God did it. And he looked at things and he saw things as good. Okay, I just want to, I want to say that because that is, and we should never be ashamed as actually as Christians. I want to say that. And the majority of people that you and I will meet, not, not everyone, but the majority that you people, you and I will meet, actually believe the same thing, but they're frightened to say it. But in order to be able to understand we are who we are, made in the image of God, and we've got the ability to relate to him. Um, that, that's the first bit. Then we move on to Genesis chapter 2. And, we, and it goes into, Genesis chapter 2 goes into more of a dis, an in-depth description of what happened in the process of making uh, mankind, man and, and men and women. So in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was his name. See, God came and said, look, how about this one? What, what do you want to call this one, Adam? Yeah. You, you okay? Do you, want, do you want a giraffe as a companion? <laughs> and then and, and they decided between themselves, no, probably that's not the best. Can't reach up to kiss, kiss the giraffe or whatever. And... Uh, he brought them to the man to see what he would name them. Brought the hedgehog. Oh, she's a bit prickly. <laughs> I'll, get, I'll get on with the uh, reading this. And, uh, <laughs> take it however I, how I said it. He brought them. Um, so the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. And the man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. And again, I want to say, in, that is God's created order of things. I'm not saying we've all got to get married and, and all that sort of thing, but marriage is between, as the Bible says it, between a, a man and a woman, and that is the perfect way that God made it. And it, I, I, don't, I don't like to say things that um, you know, could be used against me or um, that type of thing. But I just want to say it's God's pleasing will and his, his way to operate in this world. The way he made this world is for marriage to be like that. And they're perfectly designed for one another, the man and the woman. And, it's, and this is a big part, of, and I'm not talking about God being with us. And this is how he re relates. Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. 
And this is important when we look at what happened. Because remember they're told not to eat from the fruit of the tree? But we'll see what, what happens there. I'm going to say this. Um, pride has no place in the kingdom of God. You, you look at it and you see that pride caused Satan to fall. You see that when we look at how Adam and Eve fell, it was because of pride. And I just want to say that the Pride Festival is aptly named because we cannot decide who we are. We are made in the image of God and he made us male and female. He created helpers suitable for one another. And, you know, I, I just, you know, I'm saying this, this is absolute Bible truth. It's, and it's not with any lack of compassion or anything like that or, or, or judgment. But I, I am saying that this is very clear, the Bible teaching is being challenged massively in our society. And yet God wants to be with us. And he's created this sort of way of doing things to be with us. Because he loves us. Every single person. And in him, we can be who he truly intended us to be. And there's nothing. It talks about, um, actually, I think in Revelation, that there's pride. The proud will not go into heaven. We all have to humble ourselves before our Creator. And I don't see anywhere in the Bible that pride's a good thing. I really don't. I think when we talk about being proud of something, we, sometimes we talk about, you know, it's the, uh, uh, the sense of achievement and all this sort of stuff. And the, there's elements of that are good, good, being satisfied with the work, labor of our hands. But pride's the wrong word. It really is the wrong word. And um, but Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. In Genesis chapter 3, we look at the fall. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good, this is for, for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. Do you know, I'm going to be wise. I'm going to have wise. I'm going to know between the good and um, evil. I know God told me not to do it, but I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to do it. She also gave some to her husband, who the, um, the instruction was given to in the first place, by the way. Uh, when you read the, the earlier account, that God gave the instruction to the man. So he, he's, he hasn't really got a, any excuse. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and yet it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened... And they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. They disobeyed God. But this is the bit that I want to, verse 8. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. They'd been used to walking with him and fellowship with him. And because they'd disobeyed, there was a number of things that went on. They felt shame because they'd done wrong. Who knows that we sometimes feel shame when we've done things wrong. But that shame stopped them from wanting to meet with God. It separated, dis, dis, disrupted the relationship between them and God. But the Lord God called to the man. Remember, God wants to be with them, and it's wonderful being with him. But then, because they did wrong, they felt ashamed and were separated. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? And he answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid. So not only is there shame, but there's fear. Because I was naked, so I hid. 
And this beautiful relationship with God here was disrupted and broken. And God said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? A simple answer would be, oh yes, I'm really sorry. Please would you forgive me? <laughs> but the man said, and there goes on here, casting the blame. The man said, the woman you put with me, <laughs> Oh, God, you made me sin. Your fault, not my fault. And if it's not your fault, it's her fault. <laughs> and straight away you see that sin has broken this, disrupted this relationship with God. And has disrupted the relationship with one another. This is an explanation, understanding of what, where the world is at today. And there has to be something to do done to deal with that to deal with that sin which disrupts the relationship. God never stopped wanting to have that relationship with his people. And it really amazingly is it is it in Corinthians it talks about the second Adam, like the first Adam brought sin into the world the second Adam dealt with it to pro provide grace and freedom for many In God never stopped wanting to be with his people the Old Testament it just highlighted this separation but it covered over that sin Jesus came and he dealt with that sin and then he said he poured out the Holy Spirit. And we're going to look at this more next week, but the Holy Spirit would be with us, God with us, and God in us, because Jesus has paid that price. It's amazing. God wants to be with us. He's dealt with that, that problem, that sin. I want to give you a couple of illustrations about God being with us, the Holy Spirit. We can walk together with the Holy Spirit. See that projector? Okay, that projector, which does us proud, um, is, a, as a, is an example of fruit of walking with the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you. See, God is interested. He's interested in that projector. I heard rumour that your school, there were, there were, did you ever go, were you part of the old building at the school? You, were never, you were not, guys were never in the old building at Palatine, okay, but there was an old building there which got knocked down about seven years ago, possibly. And um, I heard wind of that was uh, free stuff to get. I just heard a rumour about it, and I think I had Thursdays as my day off, and I was just sitting in, in God's presence, and this is an important part to actually just take time to spend time with God, and I felt the Holy Spirit saying, go to Palatine's, or South Shore Academy, what it's called, now. And I could have been wrong, okay, but, so, this is an example of so saying, God said, I want, I want to you to go there. So I got up and went there. I just walk, walked along there. Wasn't any skin off my nose, really. It wasn't raining or anything. <laughs> you know. But I walked there. And there was, a, there was a, I think it was a lady at the gate. The gates were all sort of locked up normally because uh, they were about to demolish the building. And, the, and there was a lady at the gate and says, oh, uh, yeah, hi, come on in. <laughs> she was actually waiting for somebody else. But who who also turned up for for another reason? But this is this is this is absolute truth. So I walked there, and I said, "Well, I've heard the stuff going." And she said, "Well, yeah, just ha have a look round, see what you want. The only thing is, you've got to take it by tomorrow, tomorrow lunchtime, because it's going to they're going to start dealing with the asbestos or, or whatever." So I had a look round, and the, all the 
all the tables, that, like the little square tables in the, in the uh, center came from the school, as did the picnic tables came from the school, as did that. And so the next day, next Friday, so that was a Thursday, on the Friday morning, um, I went round with Peter Young, who'd got a van, and who's strong. <laughs> and who's also um, used to looking out for scrap and for things that, that he can get. And he looked up on the ceiling of the hall, there where we the exam tables, and he saw this projector up there. So he got a table, and then another table, <laughs> and a chair, and got up there, unscrewed it, and, and that's that. But that is, a, that is a fruit that God wants to be with us. And actually, you, the Bible said you're born again. It's, you, you're going to do sort of unpredictable things at times because God's with us. He's moving and, and, and there's fruit fr from it. It's absolute truth. I mean, I could probably tell you loads and loads of stories about it. But I'll tell you another one. Right, I'll tell you a, another one. If you look at the carpet and you look at the blinds. Okay, we... We had these, when I came to the church, um, somebody put a thousand pounds in for carpet. Okay, and it was in there for ages. We, there's a big long, this is a big long story, and I know you need to um, we close, but um, I think the previous year, um, I, I don't know when it was that we, this, we painted this, or Liz and Brian and, and a bunch of us. I, I, blood on my hands, actually, scraping off the old carpet in this place. Um, blisters and everything that d doing that, but anyway, we um, we talked about the need for curtains. The blinds were absolutely shocking here. Um, at, at one year when we went away to a, a Bible camp type thing, and uh, but anyway, we, we were doing the building up and the, and we were pricing up carpet and to get the right sort of carpet. It, it, we had a thousand pounds, but it was going to cost about two thousand pounds to get the better one. And I remember going, walking by the beach, and just talking to God. And uh, and I just knew, and this fits in because Bible, God isn't a stingy God. The Bible clearly teaches that. And I, and in that walking with God, and I and I just walking along with the Holy Spirit along the beach. I made a decision. You know, it says seemed good to us and the Holy Spirit. It just seemed obvious to me. There's no way that we're going for the cheaper carpet. But I also decided I'm not going to ask people for money because we probably asked them for money for something else. I don't. I don't know. And so, walking along with the Lord, I made that decision. And I, I, I was in my used to. Um, I was in my office. You know, in those days, I, I do most of my office stuff at home now. I was in my office after that prayer, walking along just with the Lord along the beach, chatting with the Holy Spirit. Sat in my office, and two hours later, somebody comes up the stairs, knocks on the door, said, I've been meaning to give you this check for the last, about two months, I think it was. That, and it was a check for £1,800. And uh, that not only paid for the carpet, but paid for these blinds that we'd so been looking that we went to send for the windows, and of course they match it and they sort of bring it, bring the place together. God wants to walk with us, and part of it is just saying, and I, I, this is a little key I want to give you, to say, Holy Spirit, can I walk with you? Can I learn from you? The Holy Spirit is not some vague force; He's a person. He brings power, but he reminds us of what Jesus taught, everything that Jesus taught. He, he inspired the writing of the Bible. So if you don't understand something, you can say, Holy Spirit, will you help me? And that, some people, you can get like uptight and say, well, I can't work out the Trinity. Okay. I don't, I've never met anyone who's explained the Trinity to my full satisfaction in, in that sense. But I want you to, you can build a relationship with the Holy Spirit. And you can speak to the Holy Spirit. It seemed good to us and the Holy Spirit. Ananias and Sapphira lied to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit reminds us, he counsels us. He, and he is 
God with us. Do not, I wouldn't, being a disciple is walking with the Lord. It's walking with Jesus. But how we do that is walking in step with the Holy Spirit. We're going to sing a song now. And I, I want to encourage you before we do that, just to actually speak out loud to the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, I want to walk with you. It's, for some of you, it's just normal and natural. You do that every day. Some of you, it feels a bit unusual. But there's an absolutely, it's full on Bible truth. Holy Spirit, why don't you just, you can close your eyes if, if, you, if it helps you to think that no one's listening to you or watching you. Holy Spirit, please would you fill me? I want to walk in step with you. Would you help me? And would you teach me? And I thank you for that. Amen.